feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Welcome to Mobanshi's Lair, rocking your world on DreamStreamRadio.com. And welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair. Uh, our guest is here, uh, Neil D. Vokes, and I will be introducing him for in a second. I want to welcome everybody to the show and to Dreamstream Radio, and you can listen to us on YouTube. Tune in, rather, tune in. Tomorrow the show will be up on YouTube, Mo Banshee's Lair, and also on my Potomatic account. Uh, it's Potomatic Mo Banshee, so you can listen to it to your heart's content. When I put it on YouTube, I can't put the music or certain things that I'm going to get sued for. So, uh, you know, it'll be just the interview, which I'm sure is going to be awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> always come out and be awesome. That's that's the game. Uh, I want to thank everybody listening. Uh, we do have a chat page. It's Mo Banshee Slayer on Facebook or uh, hello, Zachary uh, D. Schweitzer, um, Carrie Lynn Wellburn. Uh, I see um, Mary there. Uh, welcome, thank you. Everybody says it sounds great. Uh, that was the song from a, a show that was on TV in the eighties called "The Great American Hero," and it's about a guy who finds an old man dying in the desert, and he's trying to help him, and and the guy kind of says, well, now it's your turn. And he gives him a magic suit that's been given to him by aliens to do good works by. It was a great show. And um, who hasn't wanted at one time or another to be a superhero? Really? I mean, really. We all had that bully. We all saw some injustice to that we said, I wish I were a superhero. I wish I was a superhero. And tonight, that's what we're talking about. Neil D. Vokes, welcome to my lair. Uh, hi, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you are an artist. <laughs> Make some, no mistake about some, this. Some people think so. Yeah. This man is an artist. <laughs> uh, I, I was told by an art teacher not to even paint uh, barn doors. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when I looked at your work, I went, oh, Jesus. Um, actually... When we met at the um, comic convention there um, in Tom's River, that was the first time I've been to a comic uh, con. And um, it was on my bucket list. (laughs) And I'm so glad I went because um, I I have been wondering about this whole phenomenon a a lot. Uh, and, And you were there and... I saw your artwork, and, and you're amazing. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself before we get into it all. Um, okay. Um, I've been uh, doing this professionally since around 1984, or very late 83. And uh, that was at a small company called Kamiko Comics in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was always my dream as a kid to... Uh, get into comics one day, even though I don't think I personally believed it. I just thought, oh, that would be cool, you know, like, you know, you want to be a fireman or something. Right. And an opportunity arose. Um, I had lost my so-called real job, and I was on unemployment, and my wife and I, uh, at the time, we didn't have any children, so she was more than willing to support me in the process while I went and sent samples out. And uh, somehow or other, luck was on my side, and I got uh, taken into this small company I was just mentioning, and I kind of started at the gr- from the ground up and uh, worked with these young guys who were just out of college. And I learned some stuff. I was working on stuff immediately. And and slowly through the next few years, I uh, got work at the uh, at some of the bigger companies like DC and Marvel and uh, then various other companies throughout that 30 years. Until about 10, 12 years ago, I decided to start doing my own stuff. Right. So that pretty much sums it up. Um. S- you you laughed when I called you an artist. What do you call yourself? How, how, when somebody says, "What, well, my God, you are an artist." What what do you say? No, I no, I'm just you know, I just like to draw. I mean, what do you say to people? No, I'm just a cantankerous bastard. That's what I. Am. Uh, no, that's me. Uh, we're talking about you. That's a whole nother show, Neil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I usually started out by saying I'm a bitch. 
<laughs> well, professionally, yes, I am an artist. I, I just, uh, the what little humility I have left after all these years, it's still, I, I still stumble when, uh, when somebody says that and I automatically make a joke. It's just a, kind of a natural yeah. instinct. Yeah, I, I, I do too. <laughs> Only it's because I know it's true. I'm a bitch. Uh, no, really. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, uh, phenomenal. And you're, you had you gave me a link to a site uh that's all volks v o l k s uh that i guess is how uh, that and your facebook is how you keep uh in contact with your fans Pretty uh much, the, yeah. now i'm going to tell everybody what happened uh when i went to this comic con i was so impressed i bought 75 dollars worth of books uh which turned out to be like 3 or 4 uh, they were graphic novels, and everybody knows Teddy has Alzheimer's. And I had him on my table next to me so that I knew I was doing the show, and I was referring to them and looking them over. And uh, somebody whose name starts with Teddy uh, <laughs> picked him up, and he shredded them all with the uh, scissors. So now I have to go back out and meet all these guys and do buy their uh, their uh, books again. Uh, so I don't have them here. <laughs> but that's a, a day in the life of Alzheimer's. Bad on me, shame on me. I should have known better. Uh, but what a rough way to eat seventy five dollars. Uh, but the book was First Blood, Flesh and Blood, Book One. Yes. Um. I, I have so much to talk about with you. Um, you're, did, how old were you when you finally got established in this uh, in in the comic book uh, artistry uh, business? Um, well, I, I technically the way the way I think back on it, uh, having read about a lot of other artists in the business, I started pretty late. I was about twenty nine years old. Right. You know, um, Stanley and a lot of the other guys, they were like, you know, young, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you are, you're kind of a late bloomer, but you know <laughs> yes. what? You know what? Uh, it, you do beautiful work, so it, it's okay, you know? Uh, you, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, this, you know, this all started, and we started talking about this when we met. Uh, this whole debacle over the new Batman and Superman movie. <laughs> to me, it's, it's uh, and I'm going to share a story again with everybody so they can kind of understand where I'm coming from. I know this is a serious, serious business now. I have been, uh, my nose is bleeding from reading stuff, uh, researching this. I mean, really, uh, I, I, I've got bloodshot eyes from researching it is a serious serious business um when my kids were little uh there was a knockdown drag out donny brook in in the parlor i was in one of the other rooms and i came out to find my daughter and son fist to cuff in the middle of the parlor and i had to pull them off of each other and the argument was about Scooby-Doo using his paws to pull himself up a rope in a cartoon. And one is yelling, he can't do that, and the other says, yes, he can. And I finally looked at the both and says, has either of you idiots realized the dog talks? It's not (laughs) real. He can do anything they want him to do. And they both looked at me and just stomped off into the parlor, which I think maybe I ruined Scooby-Doo for them. But there are purists in the comic book uh, fandom, and then there are people like myself who look and say, why can't they? Why can't this happen? Why can't Superman and Batman have a knockdown drag-out fight? Why can't they exist in the same world? Um <laughs> And that was what started us talking about this entire business. Uh, when you started, it, it was just having a resurgence after, uh, you know, the war effort and, and books had been, you know, moms collected. Uh, we didn't keep our, our comic books when we were kids. 
we traded them. Uh, right. I read one and went, yeah, okay, and gave it to one of the younger kids in the neighborhood or something. Yeah. Uh, it was just a magazine. Uh, it was and, entertainment. It was just entertainment. Yeah. Um, and never in my mind, and don't even get me started on my baseball collection, I had a Babe Ruth. Um, uh-huh. And I had original, when they had um, the players in the Cracker Jacks boxes, yeah. I had the cards from that, and I gave it to a little boy when I turned like 18, and I said, here, you know, take this and you know, enjoy it, you know, and now I'm kicking myself in the arse wildly. Uh, but uh, because he probably, you know, used them for his bicycle to make weird noises, uh, you know, with the wheels. Yes. <laughs> uh, this, in the, when you got into it, it was just rebounding from the 50s and being uh, the, where uh, they wanted censorship on them big time. Yeah. So you got into it in a pretty good time. You know, how did you find the business when you first got into it? Well, the as as you say, the the 60s and 70s, the, the, the comics did very well, um, thanks to actually Marvel coming into it in the early 60s. Um, but uh, by the, I'd say by the late 70s and early 80s, when I started seriously trying to get work, um, Things were kind of scattershot. They just didn't sell the kind of books, the amount of books that they used to. We, the thing is that the highest amount of books they ever sold was probably during World War II because the soldiers used to buy them. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, millions and millions of copies. And they were also in the care packages. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they, 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 were, they were huge back then. And then they also were fairly new at that point, too. But by the 80s, um, things were starting to fade away a bit. Um, but the, I think the introduction of the um, direct markets and such uh, started to bring it back again. So it wasn't, you know, in the old days, you used to just go to the corner drugstore um, or something like that, and you'd buy a comic book or you'd mm-hmm. subscribe to them. And now there were specific stores started to crop up that just sold comic books. Um, it was kind of like the whole idea of when there were video stores, you know, the, some people may remember those. Yes, I uh, do remember them <laughs> when they first came out. And you know who did it? Where I live? My pharmacist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he had a whole section for videos. He said, these are videos. And I went, what's a video? And then we got a video machine. And then those also faded out as time passed. And it's the same with the comics is the comic stores they're still around but mm-hmm. they they tend to have uh, they've they've started to fade also because of the internet and things like that but anyway when i started it it seemed like i, I was so excited that i was going to get into comics i wasn't really concerned about the uh, the let's say the, uh, the the potential financial windfall i might have made by getting right. into the business and and actually seriously anybody who gets in the comic business whenever it was if they're getting into it for the money they're making a huge mistake um yeah so when I got in there, I was just happy to get into comics. And it was a very small company, as I mentioned. So there was no uh, huge um, uh, distribution of the, the books. There was, they weren't even known, actually, around the time I got started there. So the, it was the independent books that started to show up in the 80s. All the independent companies like uh, Capital Comics, Pacific Comics, uh, Image, eventually. And, uh, um, oh, geez, there were, there were a whole bunch. Um, I can't even think of them all right now. But uh, Kamiko was, of course, one of them. And so when I got in, it was it was the industry was kind of in a weird, weird position. Um, like I say, with things starting to change, with comic book stores starting to open up, uh, Japanese cartoons started to get really popular over here. So some of the uh, Japanese uh, influence started to come into cartoons and such. My granddaughter is huge into anime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I actually the first book I officially did was uh, was Robotech. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so I, which was uh, both a challenge and uh, and wonderful. It was wonderful because it was a book that was high profile at the time because of the big deal that the company made with the licensor. Because um, the cartoons were just starting up, so they had comics to go along with them. And I got I got on one of the three books they were doing, so it was a great opportunity. But at the same time, I was it was challenged because. My work at the time was very raw, and I was still learning stuff. And I, I wasn't even sure what my own personal style was. And here I was trying to ape the style of a Japanese artist. 
Right. So, yeah, you had said that in an yeah. interview uh, earlier this month that, um, and I think it was earlier this month, but uh, you said that when somebody pulled out some of your early artwork, you were like, are you sure you want to use it? Because the, everything <laughs> has changed now, too. Oh, yeah. The process has changed. Sure, sure. Well, the, the thing is, like I say, when I started, uh, I was having to draw like a, a, an artist that I wasn't, but because mm-hmm. that was the style that the book had to be done in. Mm-hmm. And the thing, the thing that came from it, though, was the learning process. Because right. Kamiko Comics were, were doing 30-page books every month. Mm-hmm. So the average DC comic and Marvel comic were like about 17 pages, 20-something pages. So we were doing 30 pages a month. And uh, it was a great learning process. Every month I had to churn out, you know, actually it was less than, it was like about three weeks. I had to churn out 30 pages. So it was about 10 pages a week of pencils. So the, the, the thing that happened was, aside from the style, I was learning the process. And I was learning how to meet deadlines, too, which is very, very important. And because to somebody my age, I'm from a generation where, you know, the work ethic is a little more uh, yes. important than uh, it seems to be uh, the last couple of generations. And it, it wasn't so much that I was a great worker. It's just that, I, I, in my mind, you got paid to do this work, and it was something I love to do, so I'm going to do it right and get it done on time. Mm-hmm. And the thing was, uh, fortunately, in the next few years of the 80s, uh, things started to get big again because of, uh, uh, like, Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen and things like that that came out in the 80s. So comics kind of had a big boom again. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to be able to get work from the small company, moved on to the the bigger companies. Um, Let's step back because... uh it seems to me any time the comics were in trouble, somebody would try to do something with television. You had George Reeves, Superman, and uh, it seems like that show uh, brought back Superman in the comic books, you know, because back then we didn't have videos. We couldn't watch it over and over. You saw it once. Right. You know, it was on one night a week, you know. And then when it went into, like, syndication, you know, it, it was on, like, uh, you know, Monday through Friday or something right. like that, the same time each day. Um, but but when it was first out, so it kind of boistered it. And then in the 60s, you had Batman, uh, and even though it was a, a political uh, hoax type of thing, uh, um, using Batman to make political comments, commentaries, Mayor Lynn Seed instead of Mayor Lindsay, <laughs> yeah. and things like that. It, they seemed to help the ratings, but then they just fell back off again as soon as the show uh, went out of popularity. Um, let me ask you, uh, the movies, the Mike, Michael Keaton movie, I guess, yes. did the most to bring Batman to my children's generation. Um, uh, do you think that the movies help bring people's attention to the comic books? Well, I, I think you'd have to go back to the Superman movie, though, first. The, the right, first yeah, remake, okay, yes, that yeah, was, yeah, that was a biggie. That was, I think, 78. Yeah. And um, so that was a good 10 years before the Batman movie came out. And I think that that didn't necessarily start up a whole bunch of uh, superhero movies, but... It did have, you know, whether whatever one thought of the sequels, there were a series of these movies. And a whole bunch of, actually, it, what it did is it created kind of a science fiction thing because it was right after Star Wars and right around the same time as Close Encounters. So Superman wasn't so much put in a category of superhero story as a science fiction story, uh-huh. I think, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and, he, they and, changed and, them and a little bit. Then it took bit. another 10 years. And in that, pro- in that 10 years, they were working on trying to get a Batman movie put together because... Of the success of Superman, right? Yeah, so, uh, the but third, Batman the, definitely was was huge. So it made a huge difference in, in, in the way things are. I could have lived without the third Superman movie, well, uh, but that's me. Have. That that yeah, that's me. Um, you know, I think the first one was perfection. The second yes. one, eh, and the third one, oh come on! Uh, but you know, that's me. That's me. You know, uh, and and again, you know, you had to pay to go to a movie, and you sat there and said, "I paid yeah. to see this." Yeah. Uh, now it's not 
necessarily, and I don't want to give anything away for the new movie because a lot of people are waiting to see it in their homes. Um, uh, but um, I, I, I was kind of uh, wondering, are, are the movies an asset to the comic books or are they detrimental to the comic books? I, I don't think they're detrimental, but I don't honestly think they're that much of an asset either. Um, I've, I've naturally talked to a lot of people in the business about that. And the same with like some of the retailers that I've known through the years that I see every, every now and then. And the, the, the problem, it, it's, well, not a problem really. The thing is that when, when one of these movies comes out, there is a, a resurgence of interest in some of the comics. Right. But then it fades until the next movie. It's it's not a consistent thing. The the movies are not really creating a bigger market for comics. Okay. But right now because of the the fact that a lot of these movies are making so much money for their producers, the comics are now becoming the source material for movies. It's kind of the opposite way around. And the so the movies aren't really feeding into the comic industry. The comic industry is feeding the movies. Right. Um and it, it's good for them. I mean, yeah, they, they do sell some more, but it's it, it's not like they continue on past the time the movie's out. Right. You know? Yeah. So I think it's it's in it's in jumps like that. Every time a big movie comes out, people buy that particular book or something similar, and then that, that then they lose interest. Oh, then another movie comes out. Oh, let's buy a couple more of those books. So you see, it's not I don't think it really helps, but it, it doesn't hurt either. Right. Uh yeah, um I was uh I think one of the biggest things that happened to help comic books was the Big Bang Theory, because they're <laughs> always in the comic book store. Yeah. And um, I really, um, I we don't have a lot of comic book stores. We've never had a, I live near Red Bank, where the, the comic book guys that are on AMC. Yeah, Kevin Smith's store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've never been in there. My son's <laughs> been in there. He went, yeah. Okay, uh, you know, and he's, he's, he, now he's somebody who as a child didn't have a lot of comic books, but he yeah. was over in Iraq. Yeah. And, and when he was over there, um, we, you know, got with the American legions and stuff like that and got just huge, huge boxes full of different kinds of magazines, co- comic books, graphic novels. He actually got into The walk- Walking Dead from uh, that. Yeah. Um, and and we shipped them out to him. And, you know, they went through the guys and they ate them up like they were candy and stuff <laughs> like that, you know. Yeah. So he, that's when he kind of, uh, as a child, I don't really remember him being a huge comic book book person saying to me mommy take me to the comic i have three children uh two two are in their 40s and one's uh 31 i don't know we went brain dead i don't know what we were (laughs) thinking uh we should have you know i i just don't know some people really need to have do you realize how much older you are now uh you know but nobody ever says that they say oh isn't that wonderful empty nesters go ahead try it again um, I'm here to tell you guys, don't do that. Uh, really, talk to a priest, you know, talk to somebody, talk to a mid nurse, a uh, midwife, something like that. Uh, but yeah, um, now Matthew was into Playboy. He'd go into the garbage bins around the neighborhood, and I found Playboy under the bed. Oh. Um, a- Andrew, <laughs> Andrew was not. Uh, but he was 10 years older than the, the other one. Uh, so, you know, uh, Andrew was not so much into them, but he was into uh, all the cartoons on the TV. And when the videos came out, we got, uh, you know, of course, I got him the Marvel Captain America, who is, a, that's yeah. my favorite one, is yeah. Captain America. Cap is always going to be my favorite superhero. <laughs> um, that's just me. Uh if he's wearing tights, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it, I, I think that it's, I'm s- shocked to see how much importance, um, like the Big Bang with the, 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 the comic book store. And when it burns down, everybody's so bummed out and everything. Yeah. Because a lot of these books are not going to be worth anything. 
you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now. The ones yeah. that are worth something are the original ones from back in the 40s when World War II broke out and they started doing the paper drives. Right. And mom was throwing them in the, the bin saying, that's for the paper drive. That's for the, and that's why we have so few of them left. Yeah, that's well, why they... That's, that's, why why, they're worth, that's why they're worth something because they're yeah. rare. They're rare, yeah. And it seems like in the 90s... Uh, uh, Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a little earlier than that. Um, all of a sudden, they became big business, didn't they? Well, they became big business for retailers. Yeah. Not really for collectors. Because uh, uh, one of my favorite stories that I learned years and years ago was um, way back when uh, Todd McFarlane did that uh, that that new one is- first issue of Spider-Man that had all the little spiders all over the cover. Right. And... Uh, it was a huge seller. It's I, I'm guessing here, but I believe it sold something like a million copies. I could be wrong, but it was really high like that. Mm-hmm. And it, it was huge, and everybody got excited. And, it, it, and because the whole speculation market had started up, everybody started you know, buying them up mm-hmm. because they figured someday those are going to be worth something. But years later, when talking to this, this fellow I talked to, he said, you know what, my basement has boxes full of Spider-Man number one. Because the thing is, again, it's not rare. There's a million right. copies of them. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you can't create a popular book. You can't create a collectible. Collectibles happen for reasons that are hard to understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and it usually comes down to like what you're saying. Because it's, there's not many of them, be it stamps or books or whatever, music or whatever, then it becomes rare, and then it's worth something to people. Mm-hmm. But if uh, you've got, you know, tons yeah. and tons of copies of them, then it's a it's a false speculated market. It's it's a false collector's market because the retailers say this book is worth this much money, and yet yeah. if you walk into their store and try to sell them that book, they won't give you anywhere near that much money for it. But they'll sell yeah. that for that much money. Sure, you know, it's buyer beware. Uh, you and I both love uh, Universal movies and, oh, yeah. and, and, and Hammer movies and all. Well, the, the Lost Boys, do you remember the scene in the, when he first meets the Fro- Frog Brothers and yes. he's looking yes. for the Superman or something and he says, yeah, I'm always out looking for the third one, you know, <laughs> and he's so stuck up about it because that's a rarity, you know, there's only three in existence and yeah, I'm looking for the third one, I'm always out for the look and uh you know um that's that's books are the same way um yeah. you can have a book but if there's another copy of it somewhere it's not rare then you know yep. that's and, why i i personally through the years i when when the when the speculation market the collector's market started up i started getting uh, very frustrated because a lot of young people were coming in uh, talking about that, you know, collecting this book or that book, and it had to be in, uh, in, in my law. In the sleeve. In the sleeves, yeah. or they kept it in boxes. And, 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 and I, would, I would give them a kind of a, a frowny face, you know, and say, look, you know, when I was your age, I went to the store, like you said earlier, I went to the store and I would buy a couple of comics and I'd be reading them as I'm walking over to my friend's house. And then I'd go to my friend's house and we'd sit on the floor and we'd look at each other's comics. We'd trade them back and forth like trading right. cards. And, and if you went home with the books, you'd fold them up and put them in your back pocket. And yep. they'd get this look on their face, these kids, like, oh, my God, how could you do that? And I said, because it's, it's a piece of entertainment. It's, it's like a bag of potato chips. It tastes really good, but you're not going to save it for later. Yeah. You know, you're going to uh, eat it now, enjoy it, and then you move on. You know, in the old days, and and um, this is just a little bit of information, people. So, if you find boxes of rare books or anything, you might want to use gloves because back in the old days, uh, to keep bookworms and things from getting at the paper, they would take it, sprinkle arsenic all over the books <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, I mean, what are you going to do? Pack these things away in boxes and spread arsenic all over it. Say, now, <laughs> don't anybody touch this for 75 years, and maybe there won't be another one left. I mean, really, um, it's like it's like having a, a, an incredible record by Ella Fitzgerald to never... Never taking it out of the sleeve. Yeah, you know it's incredible, to it. but you've never listened to it. Yeah, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
I'm kind of uh, and and I guess this is a good time to talk about what is a purist <laughs> and and these are my terms. These are nobody else's terms. This is just me trying to make sense of this. Purists who follow storylines. And then people like me who say, why can't Scooby-Doo use his paws and go up a... The damn dog talks, you know? He drives Jeeps. Why can't he pull himself up a rope? Why can't Superman and Batman be in the same movie together? And why can't they have an ego pissing party on each other? Because they both think they're God's gift to humanity, you know? Um, What do now you have your own series of books. Yeah. And I'm sure you have people that that are purists that don't want do they ever say now don't do this with them or don't do that with them? Well, actually no, I'm not at least not often it, because I again, I I've only created or co-created probably top of my head maybe half a dozen different books, maybe a few more in my time and there's not such a huge following that there's that many people out there. The thing is, with most of the people that get excited about these projects are usually about the more high-profile characters. You know, the Marvels, the DCs, a couple of the others, yeah. like Dark Horse, maybe, an image. And and I think people, it, you, they get attached to their characters. They get attached to the stories, and, and as we all did when we were very young, anyway. And like with Spider-Man, when I was a kid, Spider-Man was my, my big hero because he was like me, you know, except for the fact that he had spider powers. You know? and, and the thing was, I think pe- the, the young people get very, very attached to their characters and feel, I think I, the same kind of phenomenon is, I've noticed is the same with music and, and with film, with pretty much any kind of entertainment. When, when you get that attached to the characters and the, the material that the, the creators are making, like, say, Stephen King's books or, or a certain director's movies or um, the uh, Walking certain Dead. band's music, you know? You yeah. get so attached to it that when something is different or doesn't seem right, it, it kind of throws you off because the thing that you love about it suddenly isn't the same anymore. And you feel like it's a personal affront to you. And I think some people, yes, do take it too far. They get way too obsessed with something. To the point where they don't understand that that creator is also, you know, a human being who wants to, well, to create stuff and doing the same thing over and over and over and over again for thirty or forty years is just crazy. And yeah, you want to you want to mix things up every now and you want to try. They something. have to develop. They have to. Yeah. They have to develop somehow. It, and and I guess a little bit of it is that um, comic book characters have always been a shadow, a, a very um, liberal shadow of, of real human nature, uh, people that are shy or the person who was always bullied and then right. finds themselves in a position where they can make a difference, right. you know, and stuff. And so, um, yeah, the people kind of, uh, you know, they the Walking Dead is a perfect example of what we're talking about. <laughs> if I were stuck in a camp the first one i would have shot was that blonde <laughs> that would have been it i wouldn't i wouldn't even messed around twice I'd just shoot her and get it then the cop's wife that was screwing his buddy she would have been dead um i'm pretty sure that a half a dozen of them would have been dead uh and, and you know actually we did this as a little exercise my sons and i and I went through and said who in the family I would shoot first because they're either a liability or a pain in the can. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, we identify with characters. Whatever, yeah. whatever it is, if it's Merle or, or Byrne in, in uh, uh, Heathcliff and all that, uh, Weathering Heights, whether it's a book, whether it's a movie – whether it's a comic book, whether uh, music, something, something we equate to, something that touches us, and and people become very defensive about it. Well, that's that. I think the 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 inherent problem with um, mass entertainment is the the audience itself, because there's millions and millions and millions of people, 
And, you know, you put 10 people in a room, you've got 10 different people. They may have some similarities between them, but yeah. ultimately they're going to respond pretty much differently from each other to the same source material. Yeah. And, and it's impossible for a filmmaker or a comic book artist or writer or novelist or a musician to make music that pleases everybody. It's impossible. Yeah. It can't be done. And there are many of those creators that will sit down and tell you that they said they, you know, if, if they're, when they're asked, how do you, you know, how do you write this kind of stuff for this, this audience? And they'll say, I can't, it's impossible to do that. What I have to do is make it for myself. I have to do the music or the writing or the story for me because there's no way I can judge what each of these individual people are going to want to see. So that's why ultimately you get people that are both happy and then the other people that are, are really annoyed or frustrated with the characters because they're not going the way they wanted them to go. Mm-hmm. When, a, when a person sees a certain kind of movie and you get the, the critics or the audience saying they really hated what they did with these characters – there's also the same group of people next to them saying, I really love what they did with these characters. So it's not this, it's not the source itself. It's not the the product itself. It's the individual way you look at things. You know, you Mm -hmm. could put, you could have two people walk into the, into the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa. And one of them is going to say, that's a piece of crap. And the other one say, isn't it beautiful? How do you please both people? You can't. Uh, Let's leave Van Gogh out of this. Uh (laughs) Cute. Very cute. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, you know, I say this about music all the time. Um, my son will say, oh, you don't like this one. You don't like that. I says, I like some things just about, I can find one thing just about that somebody's done. You know, a band, uh, even heavy metal, uh, you know, uh, Nirvana, you know, I might find one song that I like, but I have never liked every song one artist has done Do yeah. you, or one band. Um, that's ridiculous to say you love every single thing somebody's ever did or ever written or every movie that an actor or actress or director has been involved with. It's crazy. You know, you, you, uh, you get some losers in there. Well, it's, a, it's a. I think it comes down to it like a genre thing. Is that there are a lot of people who say you know that they prefer um, comedies or they prefer dramas or they prefer horror movies or they prefer westerns or they prefer. They're all apples and oranges. You, you, right. You know. Yeah, you like apples, but you know what? I kind of like oranges too. And I, yeah. I don't. I when I say I really love horror movies, well, I do. But I also really love westerns, and I really love musicals, and I really, yep. you know, I love movies. Period. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I don't see the reason I should have to only like one kind of movie any more than one kind of book or one kind of music. Right. You know, I should be able to like everything that I want to particularly see or hear. Um, we're going to go to a break because uh, I have to play a commercial, <laughs> and uh, or I get beat up. Um, and um, then we're going to do When Captain America Throws His Mighty Shield <laughs> and the theme from Iron Man, which is very cool. Yeah. Um, and, and they're the old one from the TV cartoon show. Yeah. And, and then we're going to come back a- and talk more about uh, your work and, and your influence because your, your new work is influenced heavily by Universal and Hammer. Oh, yeah. So we, we want to talk about that, okay? Sure. You're, you're listening to Neil Volks. Uh, he is an artist. He has a book. Uh, tell him where your, your book's Eagle. Yeah, that's coming up next month, yeah. Um, I, I've heard it's the best comic ever. <laughs> well, the best black and white comic ever is what somebody said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so kudos to you. Uh, I've seen your work, so I can imagine it. And, and also, uh, i got to bring it up so I could see them, because um, the, the Flesh and Blood, yeah. uh, book one, book two, and there's a third one out, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can find them on Vokes, V-O-K-E-S-F-O-L-K-S dot blogspot dot com. And you're listening to Mo Banshee's Lair on Dreamstream Radio. And we'll be right back. This is Mo inviting you to listen to my show, Mo Banshee's Lair. We feature a variety of topics, A to Z. 
and guests, all kinds of guests. Well, Banshee's Lair, Tuesday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern on DreamStreamRadio.com. And I'll see you, my pretties. <laughs> And welcome back to Mo Banshee's uh, Lair and our very special guest, Neil D. Vokes. He is an artist. He uh, has a book, Eagle, coming out. It's a graphic, um, I'm afraid to say it. It's a graphic comic book, right? Is that well, what it's I, a comic book, yeah. It's a comic book, okay. And the other one is Flesh and Blood, and, and that is... Would you call that a comic book or a graphic? <laughs> I, I no. call them all comic books. I, I, I always, whenever somebody calls uh, one of these books a graphic novel, I say, yeah, that's like calling a garbage man a sanitation worker. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it makes you feel better about yourself, I think. You know, oh, it's a graphic novel. It really makes it sound important because when people say comic book, everybody kind of sniggers to themselves, you know. Yeah. So I don't uh, mind any of that. It's a comic book. I'm a comic book artist, period. Yeah. That, and you're very, very good. And are you going to be at any shows coming up? Oh yeah, I'm one at this coming weekend. The uh, uh, it's called the Greater Phil- the Great Philadelphia Con. It's mm-hmm. in uh, Oaks, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. the next one. And then next month is Free Comic Book Day. They always have one now every year, just around the time a new movie opens up. And um, then there's a couple other shows, a couple of Jersey shows and such coming up. Okay, so. You, you're a, a, a universal, your work, um, you decided to go out on your own. Why? Wow, crickets. <laughs> uh, did you, you know, it, was it a good move, the right time to do it? Uh, well, I actually, uh, I actually did the first time back in the, uh, in the 80s when I was still starting out mm-hmm. because of the, uh, there was what, what, what's been called the black and white boom, a bunch of indie Indie uh, comics, all done in black and white, and mostly self-published, came out, and they became uh, again it, because it, it became a market thing because the mm-hmm. retailers were buying everything up because they were all selling it. it. Didn't matter if they were amateurish or professional, and it was mainly due to the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because that became so huge that they decided everybody can do a black and white comic now. So, my friend and I, uh, Rich Rankin, he uh, and I did a, a self-published book called Eagle. That's when we did Eagle the first time back in the eighties. And uh, did for a couple of years. We did very well. We sold many, many copies and uh, actually quit our regular comic work to do it for a while. And then it faded away. Again, like everything, the, you know, the market eats it up and spits it out and then we move on to something else. So uh, then I went back into the work for higher stuff. Okay. uh, The process, because this is something that I've heard and read a lot about, black and white. Um, when you first started, it was rough. It was what you can, you said your early work was rough. Um, it, let me, let me ask you, what is the process? Because it seems like this is not like what I put on my refrigerator that the kids draw, draw, you know, the grandchildren, this stuff is art. And, um, is, is there something? What's so special about a black and white? Because I have to tell you, if I gave Teddy a black and white paper, well, it doesn't matter. If it's got color on it, he'll cut it up too. But (laughs) I learned that the hard way, didn't I? (laughs) I'm going to hide the book by Mark Twain now. Um, But uh, black and white, uh, it's is it what makes that popular? What what made that such a hit? Well, the, the the time it was popular back in the in the eighties, I think, I don't think it was anything specific. Um, <laughs> I think, like I said, I think it was a couple of books uh, came out independently, self published, because there was, like I said, that direct market had come up, where you could uh, sell directly to comic uh, comic book stores instead of go through newsstands, which was a, a whole other complicated thing, mm-hmm. and um, a couple of guys did really well, like the Turtles, and a couple others did so well. That, like I said, it, beca- it started a trend. It's like it always does, like mm-hmm. all kinds of trends get started. And I don't think it was because it was specifically in black and white. I think that was just the initial uniqueness of it. And people weren't buying them because they were black and white. They were buying them because those are the books you're supposed to buy. Oh. You know, because they're popular now, so you've got to buy those. Because people tend to, oh. you know, people jump on the bandwagon. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, my, my granddaughter looks like an anime now. 
she <laughs> she got her hair cut off and she looks like one of the guys in the anime. So um, with a little yeah. spiky hair and everything. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, and she's got the big thick glasses. So she any any day I'm waiting for her to come out in an anime outfit. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you're right. People uh, tend tend to look at a piece of art and, and somebody will say, this is by so-and-so and isn't it beautiful and, and it's worth, to me, something's only worth what it's worth to you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, I don't own anything that I think anybody else would want. Uh-huh. Um, maybe the dead body somebody could use, but, you know, <laughs> um, and I keep them strictly for amusement. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, but that's me. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if you walk in here, you won't find anything worth uh, your time to steal. But all of it has sentimental value to me. Right. Um, I'm wearing a little necklace. My my 40 year old son got me at a yard sale when he was 10 years old. You know, and somebody came up to me Sunday and said, "I love your necklace. It's not expensive. It's a piece of fashion jewelry." Um, I've had it 30 years and I wear it, you know, it yeah. means the world to me. It doesn't mean it, you know, it wouldn't be worth it to steal it, you know? Uh, and I guess that's the way it is with art, with books, with movies, you know, um, somebody will say to me, Oh my God, you have to see this movie. And I'll look at it and watch it and think, oh, my God, there's two hours. I'll never get back, and I'm dying. You know, uh, when you get to my age, you don't waste time like this, you know? (laughs) You you do something really cool like hang gliding (laughs) or figuring out how to bomb your worst enemy. You don't waste it watching movies you don't like. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I, I I guess that's it. So it's not any harder than color, is it? No, actually, I, uh, well, you know, no, you know, come to think of it. It is subtle. I mean, you have to make, without color, you have to make the nuances and, and the always, shading. I've always told um, uh, young uh, artists through the years that I've talked to when giving out advice, uh, when they surprisingly ask for it, um, I've always said that when you when you do your samples, when you do your, your work, don't draw for color draw draw it so it works in black and white because if it works in black and white it'll work in color and if it doesn't have color it'll work in black and white because the i think a lot of art started to get drawn because it was going to be colored so the artist would leave things out that um may have been necessary or uh, artistically speaking this this could be basically just my opinion but I, I just think that if you're going to do the work, make sure it works in black and white. Don't think, oh, it'll be fixed in the color. Mm. You know, just make the artwork work. And I've seen a lot of editors say the same to, to artists, too. You know, the right. artwork should work in black and white. So I think every artist, every penciler, inker, whoever, should be able to pull it off in black and white in spite of the color. Right. So. It should be able to stand on its own without the embellishment. And I've just enjoyed, it might be my my own uh, personal interest because again, being a movie fan, naturally I grew up watching movies on, on a black and white TV. Mm-hmm. Kid. And, Me too. And also um, when, in, when in the sixties and the seventies, when the Warren magazines were out, the eerie and creepy magazines, mm-hmm. and they were all black and white magazines with black mm-hmm. and white artwork by artists that also did color mm-hmm. comics like Steve Ditko and Neil Adams and such, but their work in black and white, just really, really struck a chord in me when I was growing up. And I just loved the look of that. And I just thought, I thought as much as I loved Spider-Man and, and Dr. Strange, I thought Steve Ditko's best work was in, in the black and white magazines. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I think perhaps that, in fact, I, I don't think, I, I'm sure that that stuck with me all these years. And when I decided to start doing my own stuff, at least when it came to certain kinds of projects, like this stuff that's a little more, you know, horror oriented or something. I, I just naturally think of it as a black and white book. And though I also, technically it's, it's also great because I use a lot of ink wash. You've seen some of my work. It's all uh, yes. ink wash, which gives it kind of that old uh, movie feel too. And it gives it a little more depth. Mm-hmm. And, but it's just, to me, that's the way I see it. I, I don't see the books in color. Well, I've done many books that were colored, but 
I don't see them that way, you know. It's right. just weird. It's, it's just my preferred way of working and presenting my work is black and white and with some gray wash, perhaps. Um, remember the Ten Commandments, because you were talking about black and white TV. Well, it was made in Technicolor. It wasn't yeah. made in black and white. Like, and uh, widescreen. <laughs> and widescreen. And uh, we, Teddy and I, uh, when we were first married, had a black and white TV and um, a couple of glasses of wine in us. <laughs> and I had never seen the Ten Commandments. And it was on Channel 11 or something. It was Easter time. And um, I says, is it me or does it, do the rocks look like cardboard cutouts? <laughs> and as we sat there and watched the movie in black and white, we realized that almost all the scenery was like cardboard cutouts. That, that's how much the color affects it when you watch it on the screen now in color, you look and think, oh, my God, they're out in the desert. Look at those rocks. Look at, And when you look at it in black and white, <laughs> yeah. it looks like crap. It looks like a bunch of kids did the scenery and, you know, that kind of thing. It's just cardboard scenery, you yeah, know. Because the, those, those films were made specifically for color. Yeah. Right. So I understand what you're saying about, it. you know, it's got to be able to stand up either way. With color or without, yeah. it's got to be able to. Uh, is everyone an expert when they talk to you about it? <laughs> no, no, thank God, no. right? Except in the sense that everybody thinks they're an expert. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I I am completely ignorant when it comes to it. Like I said, that was my first Comic Con, and um, it was it, it was on my bucket list, and uh, it was very enjoyable. I I I enjoy. The cosplayers. Yeah. I, I, I love that, that people get into it because that's a lot of money to spend, you know, going to these things. And, and without them, it would be boring because everybody's looking through these boxes of books. And I says to Teddy, you know, everybody's looking there for hoping to God this person didn't realize they have a book worth a couple of thousand dollars in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, trust me, they've been picked clean, you know, and, 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 um, uh, I, I just found it. I thought that the cosplayers were, were really cool and, and the way they moved around, I, I thought it's an experience and everybody's got to go to one. I mean, really, um, I, I think, did, did I lose you? Yeah, for for a few moments there, yeah. Okay. Well, I think everybody needs to go to a Comic-Con. I really do. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it has to be a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I don't care. Uh, let me ask you, before we start talking about how in, uh, Universal and Hammer have influenced you, let me ask you something. Um, you do portraits. when I saw you drawing for people there. What yeah. character do they ask you most to draw? Oh, well, on the average, in, in 30 years of doing conventions, you usually usually get asked to draw the most popular characters, you know, Batman, right. and Wolverine, Punisher, Spider-Man. Um, as years passed, and um, I gathered more of a personal reputation, I've, and, and my own fans, um, I do get asked to do not only my own characters, but certain kinds of characters that are a little different from the ones that most people ask for. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's kind of a mixture of of uh, it, it it probably comes down to say eighty percent well known characters, right? It's, it's so because because that's just what most people want if they're not a, if they're not a personal fan of of me, right? So. Well, who wouldn't be a personal fan of yours? Uh, <laughs> really, really, yeah, the, the books are incredible, guys. You got to go to a site. They're on Amazon. You gotta, you gotta go to one of these things. You can order them from them. They're really, um, they're inspired. You said this one flesh and blood is is inspired by your memories of Universal and Hammer movies. I mean, were they the greatest days in the world, or what? <laughs> yes, for me certainly, and apparently for yourself. Ah, uh, growing up and 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 watching this stuff because. We got we got lucky because uh, TV eventually came into my home. Uh, <clears throat> my mother got a job at RCA when you know we came here and all, and so 
so she worked for RCA and then she was able to buy, like, you know, get a TV and pay out of her pay a little bit each week, you know. Yeah. So uh, we got to watch Zachary, John Zachary. Yes, yes. Um, and he was my first crush. <laughs> um, he was my first crush. I, I, I watched him all the time and then I saw him on What's My Line. Yes, yes. And those big cow brown eyes of his and dark hair and that voice, that did it. I was, that was it. I was in love with The Undertaker. Um, for those of you who don't know who he is, he hosted uh, Creature Features and, and uh, shows that started replaying the old monster movies. Yeah. Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, all of the old movies. And um, he would insinuate himself in a scene. He would, uh, there would be Frankenstein walking through a hall, and then the camera would cut away, and there'd be Zachary, and he'd be cutting, would say, hey, Frankie, how's it going? And then it'd cut back to Frankenstein. Yeah. Or um, it would have something where Lon Chaney Jr. was talking to some beautiful blonde, saying, to find someone like you here in these this jungle, and he'd go to reach it, and uh, then, uh, you know, they cut away to Zachary, who's wearing nothing but a grass skirt and a, a weird hat, and he'd be screaming things like, beat the bum, beat the bum, kick him, kick, you know, and then he'd go back to the movie. <laughs> he was hilarious. He started out on Sunday nights, and people were complaining, kids were tired in school, then they moved him to Saturday nights, and uh, clergy was mad because kids were sleeping through Sunday school, so they finally put him on Friday nights. Yeah. And that kind of was his place for like 25 years, you know? Uh, and I do have a signed picture by him. Yes, I do too. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, he's still with us. God bless him. He's like 90-something. Yeah, uh, he was our horror host, yeah. He was, he was. And, and you know what? I think that I'm more empathetic because of movies like Frankenstein, you know, uh, and, and I, I always felt sorry. I always cried when Godzilla was destroyed in the end of it, you know. Um, I, I, I was the one who sat there and cried and said, well, why did they have to kill him? He was just trying to get home. He didn't know where he was, you know, and that kind of thing. What kind of influence did they have on you? Uh, well, I, I think. Well, it, I think actually, it's it's kind of obvious what kind of influence they had on me because of the kind of books I do. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know. I when I was when I was young and watching uh, TV uh, like you with uh, black and white TV, the 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 Universal stuff had started to become popular on television, and because they had sold all the rights to for, for television broadcast. And then, um, and certain other movies like King Kong was played like, heck, I remember on WRTV, which is a New York station, it was, it was on all the time. I mean, it was, they would show King Kong every day for five days. Million dollar movie. Son of Kong and they'd show Mighty Joe Young and they'd show these like, especially around Thanksgiving, I think was when they always showed it regularly. A million dollar movie showed the same movie all week. They, they, they had the big one. On Saturday night, and then they rebroadcast at 11. And I, when Jack and the Beanstalk was on, my sister and I were sick all that week and couldn't go to, you know, couldn't go to... Uh, well, I, I watched all of those uh, growing up. And then, of course, th- those films, because of, their, because of their age, I never saw them in a theater, naturally. Right. But um, years later... When uh, my, my family and I used to go to the drive-in all the time, you know, with drive-in theaters, which, of course, also are pretty much non-existent nowadays. Yeah. And um, it was a big thing. It was a family thing. It was like, you know, you know how some people tend to, well, nowadays, look at the Internet, people don't actually get together anymore. They get together online. Yeah. But in those nobody, cases, you, nobody talks. Yeah. Even when they're in the car, they're texting back and forth. Well, now you get. And in those days, you would you you get the whole family together, the, the wife and kid and kids, and they get in their jammies, yeah, and be in your station wagon or whatever, and you'd go to the drive-in really early, have some food. The kids would be playing in the playground with all these other strange kids, and everybody would be getting along, just having a good time, and and the parents would be sitting in their lounge chairs outside the car, and they're all watching. 
waiting for the movie to start, and then you'd get to the movies. Well, what happened after growing up watching Universal uh, films and King Kong and things like that, well, in 1964, it was, uh, I was 10 years old, and uh, we were at a drive-in theater, Route 35 Drive in Hazlitt, New Jersey. I, I, I remember to this day. I live four miles from there. <laughs> there you go. See? And, we, um, and that, that, that was a turning point in my life, and the, the, I think the main inspiration that, that hit me was then, because the, they were playing four movies, and it was uh, Goliath and the Vampires with Gordon right. Scott as Goliath. Well, actually, technically, it was Machiste or something. And um, Godzilla versus The Thing, which, of course, mm-hmm. was Mothra. And um, Curse of Frankenstein and Horror of Dracula. Mm-hmm. And I had never seen any of those four movies at all at that point, because it was 1964, so I think Godzilla had just, that Godzilla film had just come out. And so did that um, Goliath movie. Well, the two um, Hammer films, Dracula and Frankenstein, had come out in 57 and 58, and this was a re-release. They were sent back to America as a double feature in 64. And, uh, in fact, I have, the, I have the original poster that a friend of mine got me years ago from that, that release. And as a kid, 10-year-old kid, and I'm watching this, and Horror of Dracula starts with that music, and, bum, 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 and in mm. color and red letters in the titles, and by the end of that movie, I was enthralled. I was in horror film heaven. And wow. then Curse of Frankenstein, same thing. Oh, it, was, it was just, when all, we sat for all four movies, which was wonderful. And after the, after the last one was over, we're driving away from the screen. And they're starting Dracula all over again. And as you, as you can remember, those theater speakers, mm-hmm. as you're driving away from them, those little tinny sound. Yeah, And we're driving away, and I've got my face plastered to the back of the station wagon window, just watching the movie and, and hearing it fade. Dun, 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 dun. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, I want to stay here for the rest of the night and just watch it all over again. Because, again, like you said, there were no videos or anything. And no. that stuff wasn't on TV yet. No. So uh, as of 10 years old, 1964, that was when the Hammer films hit me. And I think they had a bigger, more profound uh, influence on me, even then the universals, which I still love and madly, but yeah. the, the hammers, because of when they hit, you, I think a lot of things hit you around that age, around nine, 10, 11, mm-hmm. where they kind of stick with you. Yeah. And, and I think that's what happened there. And, uh, so that just carried through the rest of my life, you know, in the interest in the films themselves. And then ultimately in my career. See, for me, it was Vincent Price in the house of Usher. <laughs> and, and, um, my parents got a phone call, you know. Well, actually, they didn't make phone calls. They sent you home with a note, <laughs> and they had to go to Lincoln School, and um, it, they were asked what the problem was, and uh, they showed that I was drawing people being locked, chained in coffins. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, it, that, that upset them for a while, yes. uh, you know. Uh, but, you know, it, being times that they were, it kept me quiet, so they left me alone. And as long as I watched the Mickey Mouse Club at 3 o'clock, it was cool. Um, So, but my daughter was born in 72. So they're more, uh, they're more um, into the um, Hammer movies. Yeah. Uh, Even though, even though I am a, a, and here I will call myself a purist with the Universal movies they're they're more accustomed because they saw the hammer movies all the time on tv right right yeah uh and and so they um they liked it and of course the fact that uh you know even though they cut a lot of scenes out right. they there was no secret that those girls that dracula was biting had breast <laughs> there there was no i mean they would have had to cut the entire movie to, yes. to 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 stop that you know and and what i've always found fascinating about it is christopher lee never kissed one on the mouth he had and a he, thing he about did, that he, he did on occasion brush across their mouth right but but no lip locking yeah <laughs> uh i don't know if that's because he knew where they had been or <laughs> well no he was there for one thing and one thing only yeah so. yeah uh yeah um yeah so that kind of you know uh I actually met Sarah Karloff uh, back right right before the hurricane. 
yeah. uh, that hit us. And uh, if they were doing Frankenstein and, and, and Bride of Frankenstein up in, in some place in, in New Brunswick or New, North Brunswick or something. And uh, we had no idea she was there. And uh, my son was getting a Coke and ran into her and uh, we met and talked and I had her on my show and everything and what a doll she is. Uh, but her, her father's monster, uh, it was pitiful. Uh, it, it was this creature that had no ability to, to, to communicate at first, yeah. uh, not understanding exactly what happened. Christopher Lee's, you didn't feel quite so sorry for him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he looked like scrambled eggs, his face, you know? I mean, he was he was rough looking, you know? As bad as Karloff looked, I think Hammer really dressed up the uh, the face, the scarring and all. I mean, you know, they, they I, I think that's why they uh, appeal to my kids so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, they, they, your, your book, Flesh and Blood, yes. is... It's very indicative the cover of a a Hammer movie type of scene. Yeah. You told me if I love Hammer, if I love Hammer movies, I'm going to love that book. Well, the thing is, I you know that was the second series that we did. The first series that Bob and I did was more like Universal, which if you, I think you might right. have seen that book too, The Black yeah. Forest. Uh huh. Which was uh, all in black and white, and it was yeah. inspired by the the old silent films and the Universals. So it, it it goes back to my talking about apples and oranges. I, I like them both. Yeah, I, I like them both. Uh, I'm a little bit more partial to the older ones. Yes. Uh, but but then it's like you say, there that's what I grew up watching on TV. We didn't go to the movies a lot. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it, you know, it's, they, I don't know, even Lon Chaney Sr., uh, his, his things, there was always something pitiful about his character uh do you know what i mean yeah i i don't know how to put my you know even even the phantom of the opera i i don't care what it was there was always something uh, kind of pitiful who is what's your favorite hammer movie my favorite hammer film Mm -hmm. um it would probably be horror of dracula that that first dracula that christopher lee made Yeah. yeah yeah i think that that could have partially be because it was the first one i saw and uh, but looking back on it over uh, whatever number of years of uh, since I've seen it, which was well sixty four, um, I I think it's because I I just thought it was a really good movie and it was a good adaptation in its way of the of the story, and and he and his Dracula was amazing. It was to me he was Count Dracula and and as was Peter Cushing as Van Helsing, right? Um, and I I think that was if if I had you know the old Desert Island philosophy you know which one would you take i would take that one yeah assuming i had a dvd player on the island (laughs) (laughs) uh you know um i back i guess in the 70s maybe early 80s louis jordan did a a bbc uh dracula yes i have that and yeah uh, frank finley played um what's his name van Van Helsing. helsing and i have to tell you um out of all out of all the Van Helsings, I love him the best as Van Helsing. I will, uh, I will give him um, his dibs on the fact that he was the best version of the novel's character. Yeah. Because it was just closer to the way the novel was written. Yeah. He even had the, the uh, accent and everything. Yeah. And uh, uh, the thing is, the thing about Cushing again, I thought there was something about him that appealed to me because of his... Um, almost surety as a hero, um, selflessness. There's the scene, there's a scene in Heart of Dracula where he's helping um, Arthur um, dispose of his his uh, sister, his sister, in you know staking her. And before that, he he goes and talks to the little girl that she was with. Right. And he sits her down on the stairs, and he takes off his big fur coat and puts it around her shoulders and say, "Oh, look there! You look just like a little teddy bear." He he was yeah. He was this friendly. He was almost like 
you know, a, a friendly uncle or, or a relative of some sort. He was this kind man who five minutes later went inside and put a stake in a woman's heart. Yeah, you know, and I thought that was what appealed to me about Cushing's character. Even my my wife loves him as an actor. And yeah, she's oh, not really into God, stuff at yeah, all. these guys, these guys, you know, it, people know them for that genre, yeah. but they they are so much bigger than that genre. Oh sure. And if you sure. find them in different stuff, well, uh, Christopher Lee himself made like three hundred films in his time. Yeah, um, and my personal Christopher Lee favorite is Goliath the Weights. Really, the TV. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I I um I liked him in that. I could see the eccentric. He goes from being the proper British naval officer carrying, and then slowly trying to hold it all together. He's yeah. believing his own lies and becoming eccentric. And at the time he made it, he was in his 50s, but he went from being a 30-year-old, you know, first mate up to like an 80-year-old, you know, yeah. man trying to keep this all together, knowing it's going to fall apart. I think uh, he was... An excellent actor. I, I think okay. these guys don't get enough credit for the other stuff they did. Well, he felt that way himself for many, many years, too. Yeah. You know, he felt that after a while, he felt Dracula was was a, an albatross around his neck. And yeah. um, in, his, in his way, he kind of came across a little cold in interviews and such. And I think it's that point, going back to what we were talking about the comics, too, where, where fans got... So they loved so much this one character he played, they almost didn't want to play anything else. And, of course, as an actor, there's no way he wants to do that. He said, he, he made, the way he put it, he made maybe 20 or 30 so-called horror films in 300 films that he made. And, but people remember all those. But now me, as, as a fan of his, um, though I love Dracula, I don't think that's his best role. I, I just think it's one of my favorites, because I love the character of Dracula yeah. in itself. I thought he was the best version of Dracula. But um, for me, one of the, my favorite films of his was The Three and Four Musketeers. Right, yeah. He, where he, was he played very good uh, uh, Rochefort. Yeah. yeah. He was fantastic in that. Mm-hmm. And The Wicker Man, another wonderful film. Yeah. That he um, I'm trying to remember the one with the superhero, Captain oh, Cr- yes, Krona. Yes, yes. Um, um, oh, geez, I know that now. Know. You know what I'm talking about, where he does that singing bit, you know, and yes. trying to talk him into drinking and all. <laughs> this guy was so versatile, and he, he could be an absolute cut-up, and they all could be. Uh, talking about stereotyping, Bela Lugosi was uh, interviewed when he got to home from England or was going to England. He says, I don't know if Dracula is a curse or a blessing, right. you know, because, you know, he was typecast for the rest of his life to be in those. And this is a guy who was in the theater in Hungary. But I you think, know? I, I think Lugosi had a certain um, thing going against him. It was his, his accent. Yeah. And his, he was foreignness. And I think that was part of the reason he didn't do anywhere near as well as Karloff. Karloff was a British actor. Right, and he had a wider range than Lugosi. Lugosi was good in what he did, but outside of what he did, it just didn't feel right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not that he wasn't a good actor, but he was one of those actors. There are a lot of good actors that are really good within their talents. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And there are other yeah. actors who are who are amazing in outside their talents. Um, Jeremy Brett. Uh, did Sherlock Holmes in the BBC series. And, you know, most people remember Jeremy Brett, Sherlock Holmes. Nobody remembers him as Freddie from My Fair Lady. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love him. And when I, when I, I've seen My Fair Lady many times over the years. And then after Sherlock Holmes came out, whenever we watched My Fair Lady, I even had to point out to my wife, I said, you know, that's, that's the new Sherlock Holmes there. (laughs) Of course it wasn't him singing. But no, you know, no. It, it was him, and and it's just kind of fun watching these. Actually, Brett played Dracula also. Brett, yeah, on stage, uh, yeah, he uh, did yeah, the, uh, the one that Langella did, yeah. He also, um, you know what happened here? I kept saying that's Freddie, and I had to put on my Fair Lady and show him jumping over the fence or something in my Fair Lady, and then the redheaded league where he jumps over the yes. couch. And and everybody in the house went, oh, my God, 
It's Freddie. You know? <laughs> uh, these guys, you know, when you can identify them with a character, yeah. it's, it's a blessing and a curse because then – uh, what do they do with the rest of their lives? You can't well, just what, keep that doing was one it. Of the, the sad things about George Reeves, yeah, because of he was so beloved on television as Superman, and and certainly enjoyed playing. You could tell he he enjoyed playing the character. It it followed him through his career, and unfortunately, uh, limited things for him. He was in uh, he's in From Hell to Eternity with Burt Lancaster. He's Gone with the Wind. And and Gone with it, the Wind. Well, yeah. that was at least before Superman. But the problem with yeah. Here to Eternity was the fact that it was on during the time Superman was on, it came out. And right. they said that when they had the previews of the film and he walked onto the screen, everybody in the audience went, it's Superman. And oh. so they cut his scenes down to almost nothing. That's sad. And it was a damn, and that was his big chance to show he could do something other than Superman. But unfortunately people in a sense didn't allow him to, you know, excuse the expression, spread his wings, you know? And, uh, and, and and that of course naturally the 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 myth is that ultimately that is what killed him. Yeah, but, uh, that's that's never. Been he true. had a lot of. I did a show about him and um, with Terry Soto, and he runs Comic Con since he used to, um, and and he knows Noel and and yeah. all 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 the people that were in the show, yeah. and um, you know it. it it was just a lot of things. Uh, he went away, and this happened to a lot of the American actors. Right. They went away. They joined the service. Uh, if they put them in fighting, fine and good. But if they put them behind a desk or for moral moral support, whatever they were asked to do, these guys did. And while they were gone, a lot of Canadian actors came in and became established in Hollywood. Yeah. And and then these guys came back, and they were kind of like second bananas now, okay. you know. Uh, at, and that's how fickle people are. Um, so your your work is 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 founded not I don't I don't know how to say it. Not necessarily your artwork, but you're very. Uh, you were very impressed with these universal monsters and and the the hammer monsters and right. that kind of and my personal hammer monster favorite is Doctor Fibes. Well, that's not uh, Hammer. Uh, 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 who is that? That's that was American International Pictures. Oh, uh, okay. He, it, yeah. he would that that kills me. <laughs> I laugh so hard. He is hilarious in that. Um, you know, and, and, and that's another actor with a big, huge range, Laura, huge, huge range uh, of different things. And people only remember him for like, you know, a few things, you know, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, there's so much more to these people. Um, when you draw, do you ever envision your favorite actor being in that part? Or well, sometimes, yes. Sometimes I yeah, definitely do. Does that help, really? I, it helps me because I, um, you know, the the term method actor. Right. Well, I'm. I always I always joke that I'm a method artist, and um, I use either specific people in mind when I'm drawing certain characters, or specific emotions or character traits or whatever. Because I, I, I to me, I try to. In, in a sense, make my own little movie. When I draw a comic book story, I'm trying to tell a, a, a little movie on, right. on on a piece of paper. And so for me, I need to go through the emotions and, and actions of the characters uh, while I'm playing or, or drawing them. And in the sense of certain particular characters, I, I will sometimes actually pick an actor and keep in mind. In, in Flesh and Blood, I drew out a bunch of sketches that were basically some of the actors that are that are in the Hammer films as influences for certain of the characters in the book, though not the ones they would have normally played. You know, I might right. take uh, like uh, Michael Goff, who was in several of the films, and yes. make him play him as a different character, or Andrew Keir as a different character, whatever. It it, it just it gave me a, a basic physical look in my head that mm-hmm. they would, though they never specifically looked like those actors. There was something in, in while I'm drawing it anyway, while I'm telling the story, that that's who I'm thinking of, you mm-hmm. know, playing this part, you know. 
So you know, it's, um, it definitely happens. When when whatever her name was was writing Gone with the Wind, years for years people said, Who did you think Rep Butler was? <laughs> and and she would never answer him. And finally she said, And you're gonna die. That her inspiration for Rep Butler was Groucho Marx. <laughs> really? Without the mustache. Um because in person he was very genuine. He was, she said, he was very handsome. Yeah. He he treated a lady like a lady. He wasn't Groucho the comic. Right. He was he was, the, you know who who he was, you know, and and uh, he impressed her so that that's who she based. Well, that's, that's the funny thing if you read read interviews with some of the authors that have created famous characters, and the people they did have in mind, like like. Um, um, with James Bond, um, he when he when he wrote the character in his head, he was thinking uh, uh, Hoagie Carmichael, the musician, right, and, and who looks virtually nothing like any of the actors who have played James Bond. Right, they, the closest he probably would have been is like David Niven or somebody like that. Right, you know, so uh, Columbo. Do you know who they wanted originally to do Columbo? Who was that? Bing Crosby. Well, I can see that though. The jacket. The way, uh, hey, 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 guy, you know, hey, uh, slide that past me again. That, that, you know, and the, always with the trench coat, you know, the the, yeah. the raincoat and all. Yeah, um, that's exactly who but they want. I think Peter Falk, though, also brought a whole lot of himself to the character. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I could see that bumbling double talk, you know, that kind of thing that he did, you know. Uh, but it amazes me, yeah. Uh, your work, uh, it, it, these these graphic novels, tell everybody where they can find them. Well, uh, you just have to either find them in your comic shop or uh, online um, through Amazon. Or uh, uh, Right now, I guess Amazon, because the, uh, the main place to track them down were, I suppose, on eBay. I found a few of my own books on eBay when I needed them. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I don't have copies of all my books anymore. I have just a few here and there. And so sometimes I'll actually have to buy my own books. And, yeah. Uh, either I'll get them if I can from the company that put them out, which isn't always that, you know, possible. Or, like I say, go to go into Amazon or one of the book online books uh, websites and you can track some of them down. Or even if, uh, you know, worst comes to worst, you can always, you know, send me a you know, a, a message on Facebook or an email or something and say, you know, Gee, I can't find this. Where can I track that down? And because unfortunately, in my case, none of my books ever sold a million copies. So yeah. they're not lying in the, the basements of various comic book stores. Yeah. You know, there, there's a few here and there throughout. But uh, but there's the, the, I'd say, actually, if, if my books were more popular, they would be rare. And they would be worth a lot of money, but they're not that popular in comparison. Well, actually, we just made them more more rare because we <laughs> <Yes>. just <laughs> we just got <laughs> them shredded. <laughs> so Teddy is helping your cause. See, well, there's a method to that madness. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even look at it. I'm like, oh no, no, no. And I, and when he's done with it. And this is a throwback, like I told you earlier, from when he was a child. His mother would give him, like, magazines or junk mail, tell him, you know, cut it up to keep him busy. Right. He was a depression child, you know, and keep him busy, that kind of thing. Sure. And I'm like, please, please tell me you didn't. And he says, well, I caught up the, the, the newspapers and stuff that were there. You know, he, he doesn't see a book that, you know, I just paid 25 bucks for. You know, I'm like, oh, for the love of God. Did you at, uh, least, did you at least get to read some of them? First? I got through it. I got through it. And, and thank God. Uh, but that was it. <laughs> that's it and when i first realized they were gone i kept asking everybody my granddaughter it's okay if you have it just tell me so i know you have it and she says no i didn't take it you know i thought maybe she read it or something i'm like oh jesus no and uh it looks like confetti when he's done with it really um oh my goodness. It, uh yeah honest to god it's little tiny tiny like microchip sized <laughs> And and it must have been beautiful. I mean, if somebody needed wedding confetti, it, it's and they pick the garbage, they'll find it. Okay, so we are going to go there because when we met, 
we were talking about Superman versus Batman or Batman versus Superman, right. whatever it was. Right. I liked the movie. My yeah. son is um, the, the Marine, you know. Um, he, he was a little bit dubious about it. And I said, give it a chance. Go see the damn thing before you, you know, <clears throat> rip it apart. Don't, don't listen to critics because that doesn't help. Yes, because in my humble opinion, um, movie companies want you, it costs a lot to go see a movie now. Yeah. It just does. Uh, it's worse than ever. I mean, I've never been the time that uh, the kind of person that could say, oh, we're going to movie Saturday night. That's a ritual because we've never had that kind of money. Yeah. Um, and, and so you look at, you know, your kids and think, gee, do they want to eat this week or should I go see a movie, you know? Um, and, and not feeding them, you know, then they start to look ragged and, you know, they start keep complaining. The, and yeah, the and the government gets involved, and it's just a nightmare. <laughs> uh, and so um, I, I said, I went and I saw it because of all the controversy around it. Yeah. These companies actually create controversy and start bad-mouthing movies because they want you to spend your hard money on their movie. Yeah. And, and I personally think that's what's, what goes on. Um, I, I don't I, know about in this particular case because though they certainly wanted you to see the movie, the the controversy came from mostly the the critics, both the newspaper and online critics, and they were they were destroying the film. They were just saying it was horrible. It was but how many of them really saw the damn thing? And 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 then the the because again because of the internet age, the yeah. fans that were online that and and everybody who's online has an opinion, just like they have you know what. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, they started, and again, they start, you know, a few guys will say, you know, this thing sucks. And then two other guys will say, yeah, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, that's right. And, and then 14 other guys will say, yeah, it definitely sucks. And before you know, they've created a controversy and I don't think it stems so much from the, the movie people themselves as it did from the, the comments of the critics and the, the fans online that decided it was no good. And uh, the problem is there's a lot of people out there that don't make a, uh, their own decisions. They wait mm-hmm. for somebody else to tell them what they like or don't like. And yeah. uh, that, that's what happens is they, they say, oh, well, they, I've heard it's bad, so it must be bad. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't, for me, it all comes down to my opinion. If I go to right. see it and I like it, great. If I don't like it, fine. But I saw it was my own opinion. And that's what I told Andrew. I said, look, I don't care if you go and you don't like it. But see it before you tell me yeah, it sucks. Yeah, make up your own mind. Yeah. You know, see, well, he went and saw it, and he came over, and he had this big shit-eating grin on his face <laughs> and said, it was good. I liked it. I says, now, the beginning, he says, this was a, a springboard for a whole other line, like a, a whole other storyline. Yeah. It's a springboard. Uh, and, and it's, you look at The Walking Dead. Now you have fear of The Walking Dead. You've got all kinds of other springboards that came out of The Walking Dead right. original story. But now they've got like five or six different storylines going out of this. Uh, not to mention the annoying talk thing that they do about it, you know, and, and who's the dead zombie of the week and all. Um, <laughs> I, I stopped watching it after the first season because I wanted to kill them all. Uh, the only one I would have kept alive is the kid with the bow and arrow, and that's because he can get food. <laughs> um, really, the rest of them are just whiners, complainers, and, you know, okay, this is what we're stuck with. Now do something constructive like and shut the, the hell up. Samurai sword. Yeah, she, Michelone, yeah, I, and I would have used it on every one of them, <laughs> <clears throat> um, really. Uh, but uh, the wife and the blonde, they were the first ones I would have killed. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, there's a storyboard spring off. That's what this is. Well, and to get there, to, when you, to get there, you have to set up, and, and I always say this. Remember when Star Trek the movie came out? Yep. Oh, yeah. They ripped that movie apart. Yeah. 
yeah. said it was boring. Star and, Trek, the motionless <clears throat> picture. Yes. <laughs> and I said, do you not understand? My children have no idea who these people are. Right. They don't know where they've been for 20 years. I don't know where they've been for 20 years. They don't know why uh, Kirk doesn't, why Kirk wears glasses and nobody else has to now. All this has to be established. Uh, Kirk was not a Boy Scout. He had a son that didn't even know he existed. Uh, all of this had to be established. And still they had a bit of story where they have to go out and save the universe. And then it was a springboard for the next movie, which was uh, Spock yeah. getting killed or whatever the heck, which was fabulous, The Wrath of Kong. Yeah, uh, Kong you know, I mean... That's what this book, this movie is. It's a springboard. Sure. It's a franchise. That's what and, it is. Right. You got to get through it. You got to get, and everybody says, why do they always have to show the parents getting killed? Because that's why he's what he is. The that's thing is, what, in, in comics, especially the classic comics from years ago, it was instances like that that helped create the person that became the superhero in the storyline. Right. And and one thing I've I've constantly had discussions with a lot of people through the years about comic to movie is that the stuff that happens in the comic is never questioned when mm -hmm. there are things that happen that are uh, tragedies or like you're saying earlier about weird things that shouldn't be, uh, be possible to happen but the tragedies that happen in, in the Fantastic Four they must have destroyed New York City three or four hundred times yeah but nobody in the comics who read the comics ever complained. But you do that in a film, and everybody says, how could they do that? They've destroyed all those people. They've killed all those people, and they don't care. That's because it's live action. There are real human beings playing these parts. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, it looks different. It, you can't get away with what you can do in a comic in a movie the same way without people saying, oh, there are consequences. And because nobody cared when the thing picked up a building in a comic book, right? You know, and that it didn't crumble in, the, in, in, you know, the physics of it, it didn't crumble in his hands. You never thought about that as a comic book reader, right? But when you see it in a movie, you go, "How could he pick that thing up?" Right? Because it's it's now become real in a sense, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of people who aren't used to the whole comic book uh, vision, as it were, um, mm -hmm. they don't get it. So when they, you know, the, the mass audience that doesn't really follow the source material, they look at these things and go, oh, she's, they can't do that, or that's ridiculous, or look at the heart, oh, look what he did there, because it's, it's become real. But to me, in the comics, they did that stuff all the time. I mean, parents right. were killed left and right, because that's how they became the hero, because kids, they lost somebody important to them. Kids were picking, uh, they, they had the one uh, where uh, they were did the comics about uh, don't pick up the rings from the hand grenades and, and the uh, incendiary devices, and they sent them over to the Mideast. Yeah. So kids learn not to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, it, in a comic book, you look at that and go, oh, you know, and the kid died anyway, and Batman couldn't save him, you know, and all this. Um, it, but when you see it in real time on a movie, it, it's a bit different. You know, yeah. I kind of, I, I equate it with being a real soldier and being an unarmed chair asshole. Uh, you know, you <laughs> can stand there and say, shame on you, shame on you, until there's somebody walking at, towards you with a gun wow. or a hand grenade in their hand. And you've got a bunch of people that are going to die and you have to make a decision. That's when I tell people, well, when that happens to you, come back and complain to me. Uh, you know, but even this isn't the first time. And, and going back to what you say, cities have been destroyed time and time again in the comics. Yeah. This is not the first time Superman and Batman have been together in comics. They were back in the 50s. In the 50s and yeah. And then... They were together, and of course, they don't like each other. They're they're but they, both. See, back then though, they were buddies. Yeah, they, because it was a different time. Yeah, as as, as comic books uh, evolved through the years and changed with the times, you know, basically post Vietnam, right. suddenly heroes started to become anti heroes. 
Yeah. And look at the first the first big hit that Clint Eastwood had was a movie about a gunslinger who really wasn't all that nice. Yeah. But if it was say five years earlier, he would have had to, he would have been the good guy, and he would have been a lot nicer guy. Yes. And, but they became anti heroes. That's why people like Punisher and Wolverine and characters like that came around. Yeah. So things got darker. Things got more violent because supposedly they're quote unquote more realistic. That mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Know, I don't unfortunately, know. we've lost our our true blue heroes that we grew up with. Right. You know, when I talk, I talk about the TV shows I watched as a kid to uh, younger people. And I said, we had shows like, you know, the Lone Ranger. Yeah. And, and, uh, and all these Cassidy. they were all the guys with the white hats. They, the, 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 all the, the family shows were uh-huh. all together. There were no divorced families. There were no mothers and fathers bickering with each other and children talking back to their parents. None mm-hmm. of that existed on television. You come um, up with a certain value, I think, moral values and moral center and a, a respect for certain people that that go the extra mile. And, I, and we've lost that because of how times have changed. Yeah, Paul Peterson was on my show. He was on the Donna Reed show. Yep. And he said, um, you know, the last year of doing the show was rough because – He's this perfect kid in this perfect family, he says. And then when he got off the lot, it was Vietnam and, and peace demonstrations and drugs right. and kids and kids, you know, doing all kinds of things. He said, "Talk about a a a tear in reality." You know, he says, yeah. "I was doing a show that didn't." resemble anything that was actually happening out yeah. there you know it was in a time void the and thing is uh, we didn't we didn't want to see that when no when we were watching the news around the time of vietnam when we started to finally see what was actually happening out there in the real world you didn't want to see that you wanted to go back and watch something innocuous something to get away i don't want to watch movies and tv shows about real life i yeah. want to i want to get away from it. real life is scary um, you, know? you know, my first husband, um, I got divorced, guys. I didn't kill him. Not that one. <laughs> um, okay, just letting you know he's alive somewhere. I don't care where, but he's alive. Um, but um, the mailman was like, it, it, if he walked up to your door, or the guy, a, a cab driver, would walk up to your door. They were the most hated people because we knew somebody is dead. Yeah. You know, so uh, so when you you saw them not put the letter in the box, but start going up the walk, you know, you tensed up because you yeah. didn't know what was going on. So, yeah, we we absolutely didn't want to see this crap going on because we all had husbands over there, yeah. uh, you know, and children. And and you're wondering, how am I going to go this alone and what's going to happen? So you're right. Uh, it, it Vietnam was, I think, really the first war that was televised in our, our parlors yep. every day. Every and day. And also we, the stuff that went on in the politics. Suddenly we started right. losing faith in our politicians, in our government. Yeah. Was, everything just changed in the 60s. It just literally changed. And the end of the 60s was two more assassinations. Yeah. I mean, it, and you're growing. And, and again, I grew up in that era, you know, like I, I, I was a teenager in the, near the end of the 60s. And they still had the draft. And I was... I was scared to death that I was going to get called in, you know, mm-hmm. and and then fortunately for me anyway, they, the, the draft thing changed just as I reached the, that age. Right. And um, I, w- I was not called in, thank God, because mm-hmm. I don't know how, I just don't think I could have handled it. I don't, I don't think that was, that's not the person I am. I, I may yeah. watch horror movies and action movies and, and westerns where people have gunfights and stuff. But again, and you may draw not, people killing each other, it's not but real. you're not a killer. Yeah, I'm not. I don't. I, you know, like people say, I don't think. I don't think I could be that person unless, God forbid, you know, I was confronted, like say you were put in that position, you right? Know, with my family, with my mm-hmm. wife and my daughter, then who knows what I might do? I, yeah. I might also run away like a scared little girl, but uh, I don't Paul's- know. Paul Servino says something. Uh, he says, uh, "I'm not a mobster." I'm yeah. not this. I'm an artist. I'm I um I make bronze castings. I I I'm a singer. 
I'm a singer. I, I sing opera, you know. But everybody expects to see what's his name from Dick Tracy uh, <laughs> lips or whatever. Uh, or they expect to see somebody from uh, a mob movie, you know. Um, like the guy it, he played in The Rocketeer. Yeah, yeah. I may be a mob. I may be a um, mob, but I'm American, one hundred percent. Yeah, I love that movie, The Rocketeer. Another great, great character. I love that movie. Uh, it did terribly. It did terrible, and I love that movie. And I don't know why it did terrible. Because nobody I, wanted to see it. No, nobody, I, no, I know. The mass audience didn't want to see it. A- anybody that can see that movie, it's great. Uh, the score is great. The movie's great. The acting's great. I love it. At the end, what's his name? The guy who played Bond says, it's acting. You know, I was acting. He's a, he's a, a bum, you know. And the, it shadow, was, the shadow movie was really good, too. I thought the shadow was very good. And the Phantom. Yes. All three of those characters. See, they're old-fashioned characters that are more uh, black and white, in a way. Mm-hmm. And uh, apparently, people didn't want to see that. Yeah. You know? I, I don't know why. Uh, you see, I look at it and think, I, I love to see that. But The Walking Dead, um, it's, well, number one, you stake somebody through the head with something and powder comes out. Don't tell me their brain's been keeping them alive. I don't want to hear that. That's, you know, if they pull it out and a bunch of ketchup comes out, I'll say, okay, you know, something's working. But it, that always makes me laugh to no end. Yeah, okay, that's been walking around, you know. Uh, but um, it, it's it's a good lesson in if we ever have a, a, a problem like an apocalypse of some kind because it's a gr- great survival thing. Like I tell tell everybody, start looking at your parent, your family now to see who you're going to kill, you know, because you know they're going to hold you down. But well, I, have, um, I have lots of swords in my collection, so I'm okay. There you go. Uh, yeah, are you are you a big collector of memorabilia of of comics? Of comics, well, in a sense, I mean, the last I, I guess ten, fifteen years where they've been making a lot more like statues and figures and stuff. I tend to collect those because I've always loved sculpture, and some of these things are really beautiful. And I tend to I tend to be somewhat focused. Some mostly like there's a lot of Batman stuff in my house, and there's a lot of uh, horror related stuff. Obviously, a, a pretty much all Dracula and Christopher Lee stuff, Peter Cushing stuff. Yeah. Um, because I I tend to focus more or less on that, but I I every now and then you know I'll go a little wild this way or a little wild that way, and and I I do have lots of figures, action figures, statues, busts, uh, stuff like that. A big, a beautiful, uh. uh King Kong and Tyrannosaurus Rex from the uh, Peter Jackson film, huge thing, Beautiful. and uh, you know stuff like that. So it, mm-hmm. I do have I, my room, my studio. I'm sitting in now. It's you know all movie posters of Christopher Lee as Dracula. And you you really yeah. love you really you're like me. You love Christopher Lee. Oh, absolutely. I I have what I call my Christopher Lee shrine over here, which is a bunch of figures of his various movies and things, Frankenstein and Count Dooku and and uh, Saruman and all. You draw characters. him a lot. <laughs> You course, draw him like a I lot. Say, I've got a Batman shrine too. I mean, I got Batman figures all over the place. Yeah, so yeah. It's just uh, like you see Dracula and Batman, so there's a very much a theme for me. Yeah, that sense. that dark the bat. Yeah, the yeah. bat. Um, yeah, I I loved the new movie, but again, right from the get go, I understood what was going on. Yeah, I understood that this was a springboard movie, yeah. and they were going to take them all in a different direction. And, well, they also and, were trying. They, they also were partially um, adapting uh, the Dark Knight Returns story too, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. And um, and when Andrew walked in, he had a grin. He says, "I loved it." I, he says, "I loved it right from the beginning." He says, uh, "It was good." And I said, "Because you understood what you were watching, right? You didn't. You didn't go there with a preconceived storyline in your head. Now he should be doing this because this happened." And and the most I'm going to say about it is everybody is tired. It's a movie about everybody is tired. The people are tired of everything going on. The superheroes are tired of everything going on. Everybody is just plain tired. Yeah, Alfred, and you know what happens when you get tired? You get kind of pissy. 
So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alfred is like every other parent in America tonight talking to himself. And of course, nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> Not that anybody cares what I think. I, he was the only character I was very concerned about. Because <laughs> I'm going back to the original Batman where Alfred like to dress up like Sherlock Holmes and wear the deer stalker hat. And he was paunchy and he was kind of a comedy relief a little bit, even though he was Batman's right hand man and everything, but he was a little bit of comedy relief. And now you're talking about bringing the stud from uh, Bristol in, you know, (laughs) or whatever that Island is that he lives on, you know? And I'm like, Holy crap. You know, what is, what is it going to come out like Rambo? You well, know? The, good thing, the good thing about what they did with Alfred is, is actually several things they've done in a couple other adaptations, like um, in the Christopher Nolan ones, Michael Caine's Alfred was right. certainly much more helpful and useful than the original comic Alfred. Right. And, um, and as you say, Jeremy Irons, but also on the show Gotham, the way, the way he's played on there by, by Sean Pertwee yeah. is also somebody, it's obvious that this man with this young boy has to be somebody who's experienced and knowledgeable in many things because he's the one who helps teach him stuff. Yeah, right. And so he was a soldier, and uh, he and he's he's a very tough individual. He's not he's not a, a fay English butler. No, he's 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 perfect for teaching a young man who's going to grow up to be Batman. And talking about in the last eight minutes, Batman. <laughs> I like Ben Affleck. I got to tell you, I, I I like him. He was my kind of Batman, the first Batman, the Batman who's, I'm sick of this crap, we're going to settle it, I don't want to, he was me, (laughs) talk softly and grab a wiffle ball bat. Well, it was good because he was a seasoned Batman, it was was a nice contrast to Christopher Nolan's bat and to Christian Bale because Bale's Where they had to develop their their characters, he's done, he's cooked. And this, this Ben Affleck uh, the Batman, or Bruce Wayne, actually, was, you could tell at the beginning of the story, he's, he's tired out. And you, like you say, he's tired. He's very cynical now. He's pretty much, you could tell, he's probably going to hang up his cape any minute. And he's then the pissed off. Thing happens, yeah. You know, yeah. And it, it, it's it like invigorates him, the whole thing. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of like, let them kill each other. What the hell? This is what they want. Let them do it. And, <laughs> and that, that first scene with the little girl. Where he sees, yes. and he finally says, how do we know? I mean, he can, he can destroy the whole world. Yeah. We can't. We, I thought it was very good. But the only character I was worried about as far as the actor being the character was Jeremy Irons. And I have to tell you, even my son was kind of like, Jeremy Irons? Isn't he the guy that screws everybody in all the movies? And I'm like, yeah, I don't even want to know what Alfred's going to be doing in the closet. You know, oh, Alfred, could I have a cut? Never mind, I'll come back when you're done, Alfred. Um, but he was, he was good. He, it was a very understated a Alfred who talks to himself because he's like the rest of us. Uh, Did you do? Yeah, never mind. Nobody's listening to me anyway. (laughs) Uh, I mean, every parent in America that's got a teenager knows that. My granddaughter's a teenager and one's about to become a teenager. And I have no illusions that the nine-year-old is going to do anything different than her parents did or anybody else. They're all the same. You're talking (laughs) to them and they're walking away and you're talking to yourself, baby. That's that's it. So I was really, that was the only character I was worried about. As far as Lex Luthor went, I thought he was phenomenal. I didn't like him. I loved him. I thought he was very, very um, understated. I, I understated, really? I thought he was totally overacting. I didn't. I didn't think so. I, I The one scene... I love bringing people together. You know he knows who they are. But, you know, I think it, and, it's just, and, and it's just it, was, it wasn't Lex Luthor. He, the character he played was fine and understandable because he's, you know, he's like these big, um, uh, you know, Steve Jobs guys and stuff, except a little crazier. And I got that, and that's fine. But it's not Lex Luthor. It's yeah. Least, not the Lex Luthor. I think they're going to develop him more because at the end, obviously, he's he's – a mess. 
he's a drooling mess. But I think they'll in the next movie they'll do more with him. I loved him. I he reminded me a lot of Gene Hackman. Brilliant, no, 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 and it's no, not at all. It, it, yeah, and yeah. and for me, we finally found something we disagree on. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. But for me, um, it's not personal. Yeah, it's uh, no. this is what I have to get done, and I don't care how I have to do it. Oh, yeah. I found a way, and and ta da! You know, he had daddy issues. That was his thing. Yeah, you know, and and so it, it kind of, I I liked him. I and I'm I'm eager to see where they're going to take him. I hope they leave him in the jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I thought I thought he was really. I liked him. Uh, you know, like I said, it's a different storyline, and and I did like him. I I the only one I was concerned about was Jeremy Irons. Um, but uh, even my son, and my son is a huge Gene Hackman, Lex Luthor person. Yeah. Uh, he said he liked him. So I, I, it's all taste. It's all a matter of taste. Well, I don't, I, Hackman isn't really, I mean, the, the way I, I think Lex Luthor is based more in the comics than in the movies. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. You know? And Kevin Spacey basically was just playing Gene Hackman. Yeah. When he did it. So. Yeah, yeah. But, the kid, uh, on, the kid yeah. on Smallville was okay, for the most part. Least, yeah. Again, he was kind of a different take on it because he was the younger. He was more actually probably than closer to what Eisenberg did in the movie. You know, it, it's it's odd, but Lex Luthor is, I think, probably the only arch villain that Batman didn't face in the '60s series. Uh, well, he wouldn't have faced him because Batman never fought Lex Luthor. That's right, Superman. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. Well, you knew I want. You knew yes, that. I knew it. I you knew were it. It was. It was in the tray someplace. I just dumped it over. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being on. Oh, you're very, very welcome. I enjoyed it immensely. I, I really enjoyed this, and I, I could talk for hours about this crap. Uh, <laughs> <Me> too. <laughs> <laughs> and we said that, too. Um, again, let everybody know where you, they can find you. Well, uh, on, my, on Facebook, very easy to find. Mm-hmm. And in, on that blog that you mentioned several times, Okay. All they have to do is just hop on Facebook and look for Neil Lokes and uh, or heck, go to Google. There's yeah. several several pages of stuff about me in there. You can I'm easy to track down. Yeah, I, I, okay, I will. I'll get that kid's <laughs> bow and arrow from the what do you call it from the Walking Dead? Because uh, <laughs> I think they're going to kill him anyway. Uh, but you know, I, I, like I said, I kill almost all of them anyway. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being on. And his books are, are, are amazing. The artistry work. And if you could see him at a, a Comic Con, stop by his table and say, Mo sent me. And uh, please, uh, you know, support his art and his work. And God bless you and yours. <laughs> and I lost him again. <laughs> Okay, I lost you again. But God bless you and yours, okay? <laughs> and you too. And I, uh, I, next time, find a nice spot for your comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, one last song. Uh, and uh, Men Are Still Good from, and it's called The Batman Suite. I'm going to play a few bars of that. And uh, I'll, I'll see you next week on the lair. <laughs> night, night. Thank you for visiting me at my lair, and God bless you and yours. <laughs> For 
something. Yeah. Uh, it was just a magazine. Uh, it was and, entertainment. It was just entertainment. Yeah. Um, and never in my mind, and don't even get me started on my baseball collection, I had a Babe Ruth. Um, uh-huh. And I had original, when they had um, the players in the Cracker Jacks boxes, yeah. I had the cards from that, and I gave it to a little boy when I turned like 18, and I said, here, you know, take this and, you know, enjoy it, you know, and now I'm kicking myself in the arse wildly, uh-huh. uh, but uh, because he probably, you know, used them for his bicycle to make weird noises, uh, you know, with the wheels. Yes. <laughs> uh, this and the, when you got into it, it was just rebounding from the fifties and being uh, the, where uh, they wanted censorship on them big time. Yeah. So you got into it in a pretty good time. You know, how did you find the business when you first got into it? Well, the as as you say, the the sixties and seventies, the, the the comics did very well. Um, Thanks to actually Marvel coming into it in the early '60s, um, but uh, by the, I'd say by the late '70s and early '80s, when I started seriously trying to get work, um, things were kind of scattershot. They just didn't sell the kind of books, the amount of books that they used to. We, the thing is that the highest amount of books they ever sold was probably during World War II because the soldiers used to buy them. Yeah, and uh, I mean millions and millions of copies. And they were also in the care packages. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So they, they they were they were huge back then, and they also were fairly new at that point too. But by the eighties, um, things were starting to fade away a bit. Um, but the I think the introduction of the um, direct markets and such uh, started to bring it back again. So it wasn't you know in the old days you used to just go to the corner drugstore um, or something like that and you'd buy a comic book or you'd mm-hmm. subscribe to them. And now they were specific stores started to crop up that just sold comic books. Um, it was kind of like the whole idea of when there were video stores, you know, that some people may remember those. Yes, uh, I do remember them <laughs> when they first came out. And you know who did it? Well, no, uh, you, you. Uh, yeah, um, this, you know, this all started, and we started talking about this when we met. Uh, this whole debacle over the new Batman and Superman movie. <laughs> to me, it's, it's uh, and I'm going to share a story again with everybody so they can kind of understand where I'm coming from. I know this is a serious, serious business now. I have been, uh, my nose is bleeding from reading stuff, uh, researching this. I mean, really, uh, I, I, I've got bloodshot eyes from researching it is a serious serious business um when my kids were little uh there was a knockdown drag out donny brook in in the parlor i was in one of the other rooms and i came out to find my daughter and son fist to cuff in the middle of the parlor and i had to pull them off of each other and the argument was about Scooby-Doo using his paws to pull himself up a rope in a cartoon. And one is yelling, he can't do that. And the other says, yes, he can. And I finally looked at the both and says, has either of you idiots realized the dog talks? It's not (laughs) real. He can do anything they want him to do. And they both looked at me and just stomped off into the parlor, which I think maybe I ruined Scooby-Doo for them. But there are purists in the comic book uh, fandom, and then there are people like myself who look and say, why can't they? Why can't this happen? Why can't Superman and Batman have a knockdown dragout fight? Why can't they exist in the same world? Um <laughs> And that was what started us talking about this entire business. Uh, when you started, it, it it was just having a resurgence after, uh, you know, the war effort and, and books had been, you know, moms collected. Uh, we didn't keep our, our comic books when we were kids. 
we traded them. Uh, mm -hmm. I read one and went, yeah, okay, and gave it to one of the younger kids in the neighborhood without by saying I'm a bitch. <laughs> well, professionally, yes, I am an artist. I, I just, uh, the what little humility I have left after all these years, it's still, I, I still stumble when uh, when somebody says that, and I automatically make a joke. It's just a, kind of a natural yeah. instinct. Yeah, I, I, I do too, <laughs> only it's because I know it's true. I'm a bitch. Uh, no, really. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, uh, phenomenal. And you're, you have, you gave me a link to a site. Uh, that's all Volks, V O L K S. Uh, that I guess is how uh, that, and your Facebook is how you keep, uh, in contact with your fans. Pretty much, uh, the, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell everybody what happened uh, when I went to this Comic Con. I was so impressed, I bought $75 worth of books, uh, which turned out to be like three or four. Uh, they were graphic novels, and everybody knows Teddy has Alzheimer's. And I had him on my table next to me so that I knew I was doing the show, and I was referring to them and looking them over. And uh, somebody whose name starts with Teddy uh, <laughs> picked him up, and he shredded them all with the uh, scissors. So now I have to go back out and meet all these guys and do buy their uh, their uh, books again. Uh, so I don't have them here. <laughs> but that's a, a day in the life of Alzheimer's. Bad on me, shame on me. I should have known better. Uh, but what a rough way to eat $75. Uh, but the book was First Blood, Flesh and Blood, Book One. Yes. Um, I, I have so much to talk about with you. Um, you're... How old were you when you finally got established in this uh, in in the comic book uh, artistry uh, business? Um, well, I, I technically the way the way I think back on it, uh, having read about a lot of other artists in the business, I started pretty late. I was about twenty nine years old. Right, it, you know, um, Stanley and a lot of the other guys, they were like, you know, young, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you are you're kind of a late bloomer, but you know <laughs> yes. what? You know what? Uh, it, you do beautiful work, so it, it's okay. You know, teacher, not to even paint uh, barn doors. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when I looked at your work, I went, oh Jesus! Um, actually, when we met at the um, comic convention there um in tom's river that was the first time i've been to a comic uh con oh. and um it was on my bucket list <laughs> and i'm so glad i went because um i i have been wondering about this whole phenomenon a, a lot uh and and you were there and i saw your artwork and and you're amazing uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself before we get into it all. Um, okay. Um, I've been uh, doing this professionally since around 1984 or very late 83. And uh, that was at a small company called Kamiko Comics in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was always my dream as a kid to uh, get into comics one day, even though I don't think I personally believed it. I just thought, oh, that would be cool, you know, like, you know, you want to be a fireman or something. Right. And an opportunity arose. Um, I had lost my so-called real job, and I was on unemployment, and my wife and I, uh, at the time, we didn't have any children, so she was more than willing to support me in the process while I went and sent samples out. And uh, somehow or other, luck was on my side, and I got uh, taken into this small company I was just mentioning. And I kind of started at the gr from the ground up and uh, worked with these young guys who were just out of college and I learned some stuff. I was working on stuff immediately, and and slowly through the next few years, I uh, got work at the uh, at some of the bigger companies like DC and Marvel, and uh, then various other companies throughout that thirty years. Until about ten, twelve years ago, I decided to start doing my own stuff. Right. So that pretty much sums it up. Um, you you laughed when I called you an artist. What do you <laughs> call yourself how, how, when somebody says what? Well, my God, you are an artist. What, what do you say? No, I, no, 
I'm just, you know, I just like to draw. I mean, what do you say to people? I'm just a cantankerous bastard. That's what I am. Uh, no, that's me. Uh, we're talking about you. That's a whole nother show, Neil. Uh, <laughs> and I usually start it. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Welcome to Mobanshi's Lair, rocking your world on DreamStreamRadio.com. And welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair. Uh, our guest is here, uh, Neil D. Vokes, and I will be introducing him for in a second. I want to welcome everybody to the show and to DreamStream Radio, and you can listen to us on YouTube. Tune in, rather, tune in. Tomorrow the show will be up on YouTube, Mo Banshee's Lair, and also on my Potomatic account. Uh, it's Potomatic Mo Banshee, so you can listen to it to your heart's content. When I put it on YouTube, I can't put the music or certain things that I'm going to get sued for. So, uh, you know, it'll be just the interview, which I'm sure is going to be awesome. <laughs> and... <laughs> Always come out and be awesome. That's that's the game. Uh, I want to thank everybody listening. Uh, we do have a chat page. It's Mo Banshee Slayer on Facebook. Or uh, hello, Zachary uh, D. Schweitzer, um, Carrie Lynn Wellburn. Uh, I see um, Mary there. Uh, welcome, thank you. Everybody says it sounds great. Uh, that was the song from a, a show that was on TV in the 80s called The Great American Hero. And it's about a guy who finds an old man dying in the desert and he's trying to help him. And, and the guy kind of says, well, now it's your turn. And he gives him a magic suit that's been given to him by aliens to do good works by. It was a great show. And um, who hasn't wanted at one time or another to be a superhero? Really? I mean, really, we all had that bully. We all saw some injustice that we said, I wish I were a superhero. I wish I was a superhero. And tonight, that's what we're talking about. Neil D. Vokes, welcome to my lair. Uh, hi, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you are an artist. Make some, no mistake about some, this. Some people think so. Yeah. This man is an artist. <laughs> uh, I I was told by an art 